Yes, so we're here closing out a really, really, really important mm -hmm. and special weekend here at our State Cultural Arts Center. Mm -hmm. Um, where we have had our ceremonial opening of the Ashe to our men exhibit, uh, which will be here until October the 4th at least. People are already prodding us on being able to extend the, the show. Um, but before uh, our curator, Leslie King Hammond, uh, leaves us for a minute, for a minute, uh, for a minute. <laughs> uh, uh, she and her husband, uh, Jose, we wanted to talk with her to leave uh, some of the ideas that she put out in the atmosphere yesterday um, for those who didn't make it to the opening. And then we want Brother Ron to talk a little bit about, about how it is that he ran into this exhibit and really started conceiving how it was something that could work really well here in New Orleans and in Ashe. So why Ashe to Amen? This is a very interesting question because this really began as a child and my curiosity with rocks and pebbles and feathers and stones and just all kinds of shells and objects that I found something very precious about. And even though I was so young and I could not articulate what I was feeling, as I became an adult, I realized that there was a spirituality a force, a life force embedded in all these objects. And then as I moved through my professional career and dealing with visual art traditions and material culture, and most especially how it affected people of African descent, I began to understand that there was a larger issue at stake here and that we had a very profound and phenomenal history steeped in how we became the people that we are today. It started with my, I guess, education in the church and then my sort of leaving the church and then sort of finding the church everywhere I went and trying to understand how it is that black people had church and could be walking down the street and all of a sudden meet, greet, and it become a sermon, a congregation, a celebration, a momentum. And I said, wow, this is something well worth studying. Ironically, however, as I was doing my professional studies at you know, major universities, this was not a popular topic. Black people, spirituality, religion, and the visual arts cultures, that was very, very difficult. However, I was impassioned, and I had no intentions of stopping what I was doing. In 1999, I got invited to a scholars conference called African Americans in the Bible. And the issue was, how do African Americans respond to the Bible? How do they integrate it into their lives? And what is the impact on their culture, their lives, their history? And it was there that I finally figured out that I was in the right stream, swimming with the right people who would be able to educate me. That led to a publication, again, called African Americans in the Bible, which was run by Vincent Winbush. And in 2008, I was invited by the Museum of Biblical Art to do an exhibition based on African Americans and biblical imagery. Well, as I was working on that with another scholarly team, I was not satisfied with the title of the exhibition. And one night I was having a dream and I knew that I had to have a title that would resonate with all of the issues about an enduring spirit of African people in the Americas, in the diaspora. And I said, oh my God, the show should be called Ashe to Amen because it comes from Africa, it came to the Americas, and Ashe and Amen had parallel meanings and were used interchangeably within many of the African-American communities. So I launched this exhibition at the Museum of Biblical History in New York, and who walks through the doors but Ron Beche. <laughs> yes, I, I, oddly enough, I just happened to be in New York. Uh, attending a conference, a, a meeting for a conference actually, and, and um, I was able to uh, be in attendance for a, a panel discussion uh, and was able to actually learn a lot about 
um, Mr. Winbush mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. what he had accomplished with with uh, mm -hmm. with that particular conference that right. you went to right. uh, at that right. that panel discussion, and of course I was able to see the show, right. and uh, Dr. Leslie King Ham and and I uh, go back uh, to my formative years as a college professor right. um, at the basically through the um, we met through Willie Birch, but <laughs> <laughs> who is a, a good friend of, of ours, and uh, we were also I was also able to meet her through the College Arts Association meetings, and um, so uh, almost annually we were able to to catch right. up, right. and uh, uh, and I, I have followed her for quite some time and learned quite a bit from her over the years. Uh, but that, that particular exhibition just intrigued me because uh, I knew from my upbringing in New Orleans how spiritual of a place this is. And um, I had uh, my formative years, one of my um, formative people in growing up was my uncle who was a, uh, a priest in the Catholic tradition. And uh, his name was Aubrey Osborne. And Aubrey uh, taught me a great deal about not only the Catholic tradition, but the traditions outside of, the, of Catholicism. And uh, he was one of those rebels in, in the church at the time and, mm -hmm. and was responsible too for the, vac uh, partly for the Vatican II liturgy, uh, after Vat uh, liturgy after Vatican II. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I learned a lot from him, particularly about other spiritual traditions. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. it was very beautiful to see that exhibit because a lot of it was about that. And of course, we had to learn about those things uh, through other sources, in schools, uh, in college, et cetera. Those things were not taught to us. Mm -hmm. And so we had to go and find those kinds of traditions in other places. And so I actually started my education uh, about um, those traditions um, when I finished college. <laughs> there was a course here or there that you can get snippets mm -hmm. from, but mm -hmm. outside of that, that's where I got it from. So looking at this exhibit, um, that really brought to mind uh, and again got me to look further back into what we have here in New Orleans right. and uh, the spiritual tra tradition here that um, is so significant and so powerful here mm -hmm. and um, when I thought about it I, I thought that Ashe would be a fantastic place uh, for this kind of an exhibit mm -hmm. uh, and actually was the coincide somewhat with uh, what was going to happen with the powerhouse yeah. right. and it started with thinking about uh, this would be a great exhibition to open the powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it did, but it also opened more than that. <laughs> it sure did. Opened many, many doors. <laughs> yeah, so it's like this interplay between the sacred and the secular, mm -hmm. and this evolution mm -hmm. of us from our homeland mm -hmm. to this place that we were mm -hmm. brought. Mm -hmm. And then how it kind of dovetails into what we did with it, that right. iterative thing that we did with spirituality, both traditional as well as evolved here. Um, so I'd like to hear you all talk a little bit back and forth. I, I think about John Scott. I think about Martin Payton, you know, both folks who worked with iron. And so, you know, we're talking about this thing that you can't see, which is spirit, you know, something that's, uh, that's not a tangible. And then, you, and then we have it captured, like something to suggest it, to be captured in something that is so definite as iron do you know what I'm saying? And so I'd like to hear you guys talk a little bit about like the ministry that artists bring, I think, to people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it's a very interesting way to poise it, the ministry of the artists and the, and the, the artistry that they bring to their ministry. Yeah. And, and oftentimes people will ask me, well, what church do you belong to? And I go, I'm an artist. I'm an art historian. I'm a curator. All churches are my spaces of sacred worship. All, all traditions are important to the work that I do and the human being that I'm trying to become. So I don't see a separation between it, and I don't see a particular domination, domin, excuse me, a particular uh, a religion or a particular uh, way of expressing one's spiritual life as the only way it can happen. It is multifaceted. There's no one denomination that rules over another. 
And so it's very important to look at the power that each artist brings to this. Some artists work in metal. I'm gonna let Ron talk about that, okay? Cause he, you know, metal, iron, um, the fire that comes with it. Other artists are those who are prone to work in fibers. Others are prone to work in flatter materials like painting to bring it together. And then other artists are mixed media or media artists, I call them, where they use any material all the way from traditional beads and glass and, and um, um, materials that are, are, are easy to manipulate to those that are found, found objects of every imaginable type. So with this, the artist goes into their space and their space where they work is very sacred. That is their church, their synagogue, their temple, their hogan, their, their, their place where they find safety, they find comfort, they find their sense of self. And it is here that they set up their, if you wanna call them shrines, you understand? Every time they lay out a table of things to work with, that is like an altar. And all those objects are sacred on that altar. And how they choose to organize them and put them together are a very, very, very special way of processing and bringing together that which they're trying to do, which is to make visible the invisible. And it's this process of bringing invisibility to light, that power, that energy, that the artist spends all of their time. They're very, obs they're very obsessed, almost. They're very focused. They're very disciplined, determined. Do you understand? And it can be literally sometimes a pain in the neck. But that is the attention to detail with which they work. That's true. And, um, I, I totally agree with finding oneself in one's, in one's time is what we're trying to do. Finding that mm -hmm. spirit that goes mm -hmm. through you. Mm -hmm. um, and I w I'm a firm believer in um, mm -hmm. looking at where you are now mm -hmm. has to come from your understanding of the past and where you need to go in the future. Mm -hmm. And so that, that understanding for me is what I'm after when I'm making a, a, a piece. Talk to us about that. Talk to us about because you are an artist in the show. Okay, yeah, All sure, right. sure. And I want you to talk about what it is, and since you're here and, mm -hmm. and you're one of the makers, talk about what, what happens when you go into that space to make those paintings and what your work is about. Okay. Um, I guess in terms of um, the piece that's in the show now, it's um, called The Prayer for Arisha Oko. And um, that is a piece that came up after the, um, the Gulf Coast oil spill. Uh, my work is typically about spirit. It's typically about trying to find um, that that spirit within the work, and it's it's not necessarily about a particular action or place or time um, at, that one can necessarily recognize or, or deal with directly. It's not it's narrative for me. Um, I can understand, but uh, I like to use a lot of symbols and labor and also layers within that labor to talk about what, um, this idea of who I am in my time um, and also about my understanding of where I come from because we can't be whole unless we know where we come from and we can't be whole unless we think about what our future is gonna be and how we give to those who are gonna be here in the future when we're gone. Uh, so that, that becomes really important for me. So within this, this painting that I made, it's actually um, uh, a sculptural painting. It's three-dimensional, it actually stands on its own and one side of it is um, done in black and white, and one side is in color. And it's meant to represent, um, and it's the same image on, on, mm -hmm. the, on black side and, on, and white side and also on the color side. In between, you find gold and you find uh, a mixture of oil, paint, and actually oil. Um, that's black substance that's on the inside. And so going through that, that process of going through this, this opening, um, you, we end up with this black and white world from this, this color world. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's almost like a, a spiritual passageway. And in that, I'm hoping that we understand that, you know, the path that we're on for seeking gold and oil is, is killing us. Mm -hmm. And so that's somewhat what, it, what it's about. Um, 
Orisha Oko for uh, he was he's one of the pantheon of the Orisha from the Yoruba tradition, mm -hmm. and he is the the caretaker of the earth, mm -hmm. and uh, he did something to upset his wife, um, which is also near and dear to me. <laughs> I tend to do that a lot, but <laughs> uh, and she actually was able to banish him to the earth for the rest of existence, and so he is the one who takes care of the earth, and I, I thought that was appropriate for us as well um, in thinking about our condition in our time right now. Uh, and so that's, this is a very uh, unusual piece for me in that it's, it's um, the narrative is very, very clear. Um, uh, most of the time they're not in my work. Um, when I started as a young artist, I, I think about my work um, as an undergraduate, I literally was painting trash. Um, and there was a, a metaphor for that. And, and that fed me to where I am now. Um, the trash was literally on the side of the curb. And uh, I was a, a young African-American male in a predominantly white environment. And dealing with that, um, these paintings helped me to deal with that particular fact and helped me to understand who I was. Uh, literally, I was painting this trash and they were six and seven feet large. And um, I blew up this, these, and, and when the, the trash that I saw was beautiful and exciting and exquisite because it had all these wonderful shapes and all these shiny things and all these beautiful objects that were in it and people just walked over it. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I felt. I felt like I was this jewel. I was important. I had a lot to offer, but people was just, were just walking over me because they had defined it as trash. Mm -hmm. And so that was the metaphor that I, I took inside of me and have been using that um, for my career for the most part. So this trash to treasure um, metaphor, and this reminds me a lot of um, some other things people say that to see it is to believe it. Yeah. Um, and so the, how do you see the, the show helping to put on people's minds some things that uh, they might not have seen before or they might not have even known before um, um, for consideration as something to make part of their reality and their truth? One of the things in our culture that is so fascinating and that we are so very good about, and that is our oral traditions, mm -hmm. and that is our ability to, to recapture our stories and storytelling and also retracing our memories, which is also another kind of storytelling, and remembering the ancestors, which is another kind of narrative. And it is about moving through the exhibition in the three different sites in which it's installed and looking at the different stories and narratives and documentaries. Some of them are literally documentaries. They are preserving actual truths of incidences or occurrences or relationships that have happened in contemporary times or in past times. Um, they are trying to capture or bring back to the attention of individuals the importance of a particular uh, moment, uh, uh, a particular event, a particular interaction. And it's through our oral tradition, you understand, whether we're talking to each other or telling jokes, bad or otherwise, whether we're gossiping, talking trash, you know, all those things that we do, um, giving a sermon, playing the dozens, um, um, a spoken word. We are especially adept because it was one of those skills that was preserved from the motherland, from our heritage, from our origins that could not be taken away from us. That was indelibly ingrained, what I call hardwired into our systems. So as we progress through history, we began to find ways to take that information and to make it what I call concrete or conceptualize it to bring it into the light, to make invisible the visible. Um, that which was hidden in plain view became then accessible. And so as you go through this store, uh, this, this, these series of stories and these series of exhibition sites that we have arranged, each image, each object really has a multiple of levels of information to give us. 
depending on how you're looking at it, depending on who you're with, depending on the mood that you're in, all right? Because it does depend on where you are in how this work kind of prods your memory or prods your emotion, your emotional state, all right? Or the fact that it's so pretty or maybe it's just so damn ugly you can't stand looking at it. You know, sometimes it doesn't always have to be about the beauty. It has to be about the intrinsic value of a message that it's trying to give to you. And so this was one of, this is part of my fun in doing shows like this, is that I'm always looking for the conversation. All right? I'm looking for the juice. I'm looking for the jism. I'm looking for the clash. I'm looking for the chorus. I'm looking for the echo. All right? I'm looking for those voices. What are those voices are about? I agree. Um, and for me, a lot of times, it's, it's that sense of uh, clash and that sense of, uh, for me, when I think about the clash, I think about somebody like The Loneliest Monk yeah. with his music, um, where he totally took it um, and changed the way that we hear it. Mm -hmm. I think we, in this show, too, we have some folks who are taking it and changing it by the way that we see it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think about Keith and Chandra, uh, Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick, mm -hmm. and um, Keith Calhoun's image where it appears to be fractured or like we're looking at it through stained glass. Right. And the way that it was produced, the way that it was made right. was through the lens of Katrina, mm -hmm. that literally um, the film was in the water. Right. And so we can think about it in terms of a baptism and by way, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we could think of it uh, in that way, and then he took it and he froze it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then uh, and then printed it, mm -hmm. and so we get this beautiful image that could be only made this one time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and for me, that was that that is that right. that that uh, clash, you know, like the loneliest monk. Sure. Um, and uh, I I think we we can go back and we look at some of the beautiful things in this room, right. and think about how they were made and that they can only be made the same way one time. Uh, and the way that the patterns are made, but they're slightly different in each one. And so you get a sort of a, an edge to it or a funk to it that um, can't be done or reproduced again. Um, but you can see it. You can actually see it so much that you feel it in your heart and in your whole being. Uh, and then you can understand it in your head. You know. Uh, so for me, I see that in, in, in this, the work um, from the motherland uh, and see it in the work like somebody like Willie Birch or Keith Calhoun or Chandra McCormick, you know, and uh, in, with Daryl Montana and actually uh, seeing how that suit was produced, actually helping him put it together on Mardi Gras morning. <laughs> um, there's that, that that spirit that runs through that, that energy that when he puts on that suit, he's a different person. Mm -hmm. He's a, he's a, a, a big chief. Mm -hmm. He's a warrior, you know, um, when he puts that thing on. Mm -hmm. And it transforms him and it also transforms us at the same time. Well, you know, I also like to look at it in terms of what I call remembered histories or remembered technologies surfacing. I, lo I look at these wonderful hunters shirts that come out of the collection of uh, Xavier University. And then I look at the work of Jeffrey Cook and I'm just awed. Um, Jeffrey Cook never had to see a hunter shirt, uh, but the way the materials are organized and the accumulation of these materials used and found natural, organic, uh, artificial, and the accumulation and the density of them on the surface reflect the kind of power that comes from the shirts that would have been made by hunters and herbalists and healers in West African tradition. Um, it is very amazing to see how our sense of organization and the relationships and the parallels of colors and textures and lines still recall the execution of how traditional ceremonial fabrics were made. Um, one of the greater phenomenologies I find in New Orleans is uh, going back to Daryl Montana and, and, and all of the Mardi Gras Indians 
who, who have taken on the legacy of beaded narrative traditions that are found right here again in the Ashe to Amen exhibition with the beaded crowns and the um, ceremonial hangings and the thrones around how beads are used to ornament and festoon a surface to elevate and make magnificent the power and the radiating energies uh, through their color combinations and also through the way in which they tra track the light. They each tell stories in different ways and they each move and function in different ways. But the ways of their movement and the meaning and the intent of these objects are also reflected in the importance of these objects, these implements within the process and the role of telling that story, recreating that story. Many of the ceremonies and, and rituals and activities and practices and beliefs in Africa had to do with the recapitulation of telling the narratives and the origins of the beginning of time, of as Ron has talked about, the earth being protectors of the earth because Africans were the first conservationists. We were put here not to own the earth, we were put here to take care of the earth. We were the caretakers of the earth and as such in taking care of the earth, you also have to respect the earth. But people are not born with this knowledge. We have to be educated from our birth as young youths, as individuals who are in a constant, hopefully, state of learning how to do these things. And this is why the Yashe Center is so important because it brings together all of this, this vital, critical, crucial information in a city where this has become a regular practice. This is, I didn't have to, as a curator, go out and look and find and hunt for people. This was an abundance. Do you understand? This was a cornucopia. This was a smorgasbord. This was just um, what, how much can I get into the space? And Ron, you did a brilliant job. I couldn't believe that you got as much in as possible. But think about it. If we had had more space, we could have filled that space too and work with incredible quality, incredible vision, incredible charisma to bring sensibility and meaning and import to the cultural uh, reservoir that this city has become for not just Louisiana, but for the entire United States. Well, we wanted to leave a little bit, and, and we're hoping, we're certainly hoping that you're gonna come back, so we don't wanna give them too much. Yeah, not too much. We're not giving it all away. Yeah, there's more. Yeah, so the, uh, the exhibit will be accompanied by a series of programming um, events that'll occur, and we'll be publishing those this week. And, uh, and those are the ones we're planning. That's not the ones that we're gonna probably wind up doing because mm -hmm. they're gonna show up at our doorstep mm -hmm. and think that this is the perfect place to be right. able to do these things. Right. Um, but for now, we're gonna send you and Jose off. Okay. Um, only for a little while. <laughs> and um, we we'll will be, be absolutely, we'll be publishing the catalog, okay. which will have uh, images of all of the work and we'll have some fabulous essays exploring this, uh, this subject matter more deeply. And that'll be happening toward the, the, the middle of the, uh, the month. And so we'll be having people coming out then and we'll be having you guys come back uh, for that as well. That's a promise. For now, we release you. Thank you. And we wish you a happy birthday. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you all, thank you all for